What's up, everybody? We got a really awesome episode of Our Kids Play Hockey today. Uh, we have a special guest today, Scott Vargas, who is the founder and executive director of the Puerto Rico Ice Hockey Association. Um, this was a great episode for a lot of reasons. Number one, we get to talk about what it's like to build hockey in a hockey emerging nation of Puerto Rico, who just won their first gold medal in tournament play. But we also got to talk about the perspective of a non-traditional hockey journey. We got to talk about hockey as a whole, how to grow the game, sometimes how competition is really more important than just winning, although winning is really fun. But overall, it's a great conversation. It's a really great episode. It's really going to help grow uh, awareness about the game uh, and, and, and representation in general. So give it a listen. It's really fun. Also, want to let you know, today's episode is a little bit of a special uh, brought to you by uh, Christy and I wrote a book. It's called When Hockey Stops, and it is available for pre-sale now at whenhockeystops.com. Uh, and we wrote this book during the pandemic under the idea that what do young hockey players do when they can't do what they love anymore? So we wanted to create uh, a children's story that dove into that. Uh, it's, it's about a young player named Leon who breaks his wrist um, in a big game of the season. He has to figure out his way back to the game. Um, and we really had a great time writing it. So check it out at whenhockeystops.com. You can pre-order now, get some special gifts with it. We're also going to include a $10 hockey wraparound coupon with all pre-orders. Um, but check it out. See what you think. We'd love your support on that. But above all, check out this episode with Scott Vargas. Uh, really great episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. Enjoy it and have a good day. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias. I'm joined, as always, by Mike Benelli and Christy Casciano burns and we are privileged today to be joined by a trailblazer in the game in Scott Vargas. Scott is the founder and executive director of the Puerto Rico Ice Hockey Association, which is a nonprofit to foster and promote hockey in Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, Latin America, and beyond. And it also houses the management of PR's competitive teams. He is a native of Tampa, Florida, and now lives in Chicago, where he is an innovation manager at Ability Network. Scott played collegiate and professional hockey and is an icon within the sport in Puerto Rico. Scott, it is an absolute privilege to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that intro. I don't know if icon is the word I would use to describe myself, but I, I'll, <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. See, no icon does in the beginning, but you are. <laughs> and, and, and like I said, it's amazing what you've accomplished within the country. Uh, in the nation and what you're doing so far. So Scott, I actually want to start there. Typically we'd start with your bio and your history and everything about the game, but team Puerto Rico just won their first gold medal in the country's history. When uh, PR women's team defeated Chile in the Amerigal Latin cup. And for those of you listening, that tournament hosts 29 teams and over 500 players. It's almost like a mini league when you think about it. And we've talked with other guests uh, about the feeling of winning, right? The, the, the great moments, but we've never had someone on, on, who was there for the first championship in their country's history, the first gold medal ever. Can you walk us through what it's like to have such a historical and trailblazing win for your country? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and so to, to correct the, the gold medal game was against Colombia. Um, you know, that, that woman's team was their first appearance. So uh, Puerto Rico had a, a entry in the La Cup in 2019, but that was the men's division two. First time the women are competing, first gold medal for the nation, like, right. like you said. And um, I, I think the you know, there's a, a few important things like about that team. Number one, you know, most of the players had never you know met each other. Now there were there were some of the ladies that that had you know played against each other with each other in the summer, um, but you know they came together for the very first time. We didn't have really any practices, any scrimmages. Um, nothing like that. They got on the ice for, I think about an hour, uh, the day before the tournament started. Wow. Um, and to see them come together as a team. And I, I you know, there was one interview. I basically said like at the, the final game, the championship game, some of the girls didn't know each other's names still. Right. Wow. <laughs> but at the same time, as, as I'm watching, you know, I, I'm on the bench, uh, coaching. I mean, they played like they have been playing together for, for two years. I think, it really, it was that, that synergy of coming together and representing something, something more, right. It's that pride of, of their heritage you know, all of these uh, ladies being Puerto Rican and, and being able to represent their nation. Um, and it's super special. Uh, it was a super emotional weekend for me. Um, I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not a crier by any means, but I had to like kind of keep it together multiple times there, especially even after they won that gold medal, I had to go play a game myself 
so try not to get kind of too sucked into it. But um, I mean, just the, the effort put out, I think one of the things that we, we had as, as a bit of a mantra through the weekend was, you know, we're going to do it by committee. We had 15, uh, 15 skaters, uh, two goalies. Uh, goalies split time in the round robin games. Each played two. Um, the players, I mean, to, to put in perspective, we had a, a mother that was on the team, um, you know, started playing hockey in her adult years. Um, I mean, she was out there last shift. And I thought that was super important to make sure that we, we made that change and got her out there. And, and, and when she was part of that moment and part of that, you know, that important shift, the very end of the game, right? Typically, you know, you think, oh, let's get, you know, top five out there. Let, let's, let's really buckle down. But everybody contributed. Um, so, I mean, you put all those, those pieces together and I mean, it just makes it even more special. You know, not only is it the first gold medal for, for Puerto Rico and ice hockey, but I mean, you just had such a great group of ladies, all whom contributed in, in every game, really. Right. Um, and, and when I sent a message to the team, we didn't get to meet after the game because some uh, of the ladies had to, to jet out and, and get back home. Um, but I said, you know, everybody contributed, you know, our, our players that were less experienced, all of them were plus in the tournament. Um, I mean, even had from that, that perspective, better numbers than some of the other you know, girls I had the experience. And if you think about that, that's important because that means when they were on the ice, we played better. Um, and that just shows how well that team came together in such a short period of time. That, that, what an exciting moment. And, and tell me, you know, what kind of impact have you seen already? with that kind of trailblazing win on hockey in Puerto Rico and, and here in the States here throughout yeah. all, you know, all the young players out there. It, I mean, it's crazy. So we, right now we're trying to launch a website. So we haven't quite gotten to that, that moment where we're full of blown, you know, marketing and, and recruiting to, to get people to that site and get registrations through. But even at that, we have over a hundred members now, like fully registered. And we've got another list of, you know, over 30 players that have interest, right. That we just need to get, you know, that full registration process completed. So from that aspect, I mean, just huge growth, There's been a ton of buzz. I mean, the features, obviously, you know, NHL.com was down there, uh, sports illustrated, the, the hockey news, they were down there. I mean, featured in those, um, it's, I mean, it's, it's humbling that, that so many people thought that that was like such an important story. Um, a lot of uh, interest from the island itself as well. We had one of our, our women players was featured on Telemundo and PR. Um, that was an awesome interview. Uh, she's uh, bilingual as well. You know, it's done in Spanish. Um, and it was just, I mean, that, that, ex that exposure has been amazing. And I think it's, it's definitely the start of kind of that, that next step to really solidify the, the um, you know, official, of of our nation um obviously our goal is to uh, compete international i shouldn't say obviously i guess it's not a known thing but um you know we want to compete internationally in the ihf the way that works i mean you need recognition from the nation itself the um sports confederation uh which we're, we're basically there now and the next step past that is to uh, kind of make strides to to meet the rest of the requirements and i think the only way we do that is by that exposure you know, Scott, let's stay on that for a moment because, you know, the first time I ever heard about ice hockey in Puerto Rico, I think was about 11 years ago. I know the New York Rangers played the uh, Florida Panthers in San Juan. And I remember at the time people going, why are they doing that? And, you know, and it's just like, because we're trying to expand the game, right? I was working at the league, I believe at the time that that happened. So one of the cool things is, look, you're part of an emerging hockey nation. That's kind of the way I look at it. I, I was blessed. I got to work in an emerging hockey nation for several years in the United Kingdom. Um, and they've actually recently got to the forefront of, of the world championships oh, yeah. in, competing in Class A. But even with them, as I'm sure it is with you, people are often they're surprised. They're surprised to hear, oh, you have hockey there? Uh, <laughs> much less a championship caliber team, which you have. So – can you walk us through what steps are being taken to grow the game, uh, not just in Puerto Rico, but obviously the surrounding areas um, and what that process is like? Because I really want our audience to understand like that statement of like, you got to start somewhere is very true. Right. And, and, you know, it, when you think about hockey in the United States and Canada, it's not hard to find players in most places, right. It's not hard to, to create a team. In fact, the hard part is usually the parents and the politics, right. You're coming from a place where, like you said, the, 
this has been great for you because of all the, the notoriety it's getting. And now people are looking. So what is it like, what do you have to do to grow hockey in a place like Puerto Rico? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a good question. Um, I mean, <laughs> I got a call a couple of weeks ago is someone looking for a Jersey for an artist. I have no clue who that artist might be. That would be a good start. <laughs> That's go. an easy way to, to get that exposure. Um, a, a reggaeton artist, but um, I mean, past that, uh, I think some people are kind of confused. It's like, okay, well, you've got a bunch of, you know, stateside born, um, you know, really, uh, you know, players, you know, kids that, that grew up through the kind of USA hockey developmental model. At the end of the day, the way I view that is, okay, you know, these players still have pride in their heritage, like myself, right. That's why I'm involved. Um, and by, getting as many of those players that are out there. And like I said, I mean, already over a hundred players. I, I, I would imagine that we'll get closer to 200 by the end of 2022. Wow. Um, and that's just on the state side uh, portion of players. And by doing that, it kind of makes number one, other, you know, Puerto Ricans that are stateside, you know, as we say, Boricuas, um, it, it says, Oh, wow. Hockey is now, and more of an option. It's more of a reality, right? It's, I mean, you, you typically would tend to go with where you see, um, you know, where you have that, that kind of pride. Right. So if hockey is on that radar, then I think we, we get growth in the sport stateside. And then that ultimately is our footprint to launch on the Island of Puerto Rico. Now th there's other obstacles, you know, how, how do we do that? Is it, is it ball hockey? Is it inline hockey? Right. I and mean, we're looking to grassroots programs, for the island right and we want to make those uh, you know a little bit more organized structured it's not to say that there's never been you know an inline hockey game or a pickup game or you know ball hockey played on the island certainly there has but we bring some structure and organization to it and we say hey you know we're backing you as the puerto rico ice hockey association that's a step right um and i think if we say that with 200 members of people that actually play ice hockey it's an even bigger step and if we say hey we actually just won a gold medal at the last time cup, you know, that's an even bigger step. And that's, that's how I think we start really putting things in motion. And that's what we're going to try to do here in the next six months. It's already started. Certainly not going to be easy. Um, you know, but that, that's our, our process. I know Mike, you've done a lot in regards you've been down to Puerto Rico. You do obviously a lot in floorball and ball hockey. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So Scott, you're, you're actually, your model is funny because it, it's, we're, 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 we're we're the reverse in the U S with floorball, right? Because in Finland where you played floorball is huge. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's a gateway to ice hockey in a lot of ways. And, you know, when I went down, I actually took a bunch of bags uh, from the Florida Panthers down to Puerto Rico a couple of years ago. And, you know, instantly, you know, we were in Rancun, Rancon and that little, that little tiny rink they have down there, which is great. I heard it's on the rebound. It, rumor has it, you know, it got, uh, got pretty beat up down there with the last storm, but I think, <laughs> When, when I saw the ability for these little athletic kids that just never had held a hockey stick in their hand and instantly within five minutes looked like hockey players. I mean, we had a couple of kids out on the, in the playground playing hockey, you know, three on three, you know, cross court. Uh, and they look like hockey players because they, they had all the moves that, that, that hockey has with the soccer moves that they had and the protecting and moving and moving the ball and, and, and getting into open space. So I think that that growth mindset of saying, well, how do I get, because, uh, you know, the same thing with USA floorball is the same way when they compete in Finland and Sweden and Norway, they actually compete as a U as USA with all Finnish players that just have U.S. Mm -hmm. passports. So that really a U.S. team. And I think it's the same same idea. I mean, the goal would be to get a, a fully born Puerto Rican team. Right. That that all these that all these athletes were uh, homegrown within the country, uh, you know, directly. And I think that's. You know, the, to start that is, uh, to your point, making that first step of saying, well, the first thing we got to do is just expose more people to hockey. And one of the ways to do that, and that's where I think, you know, we've seen that in even in the U.S., right, with hockey, that we've seen that in these in these non-traditional. I mean, Puerto Rico is a non-traditional market. Maybe California is not so much anymore. Arizona is not so much anymore. Florida is not so much anymore. But now you got this whole other market to go after. And I think it's I think it's great the way you've structured you know, trying to go about it. And when, what a way to start by having a championship to start it with, I mean, you know, yeah. and, then, and then to be able to build out from there where a lot of people are striving to just get, you know, forget about a medal round, just get into any type of a, 
playoff atmosphere to bring exposure to the sport. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, if you want to start by uh, maybe I'll get a pen and paper, you can give me the emails of those uh, players you're talking about uh, and ring phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were good. No, kidding, they were but... good. They're a little older now, but I'll tell you, it, it was a really, like I said, I think the biggest thing was, you know, we, 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 we were laughing when they left and, and I don't speak Spanish. So they were, they were kind of talking back and forth. And th- at the end of the day, the, the guys I was down there with, they're like, Oh, they're going home telling their parents they just played hockey. And I'm, and the moms are like, what are you talking about? You played hockey. There's no way you played hockey. You know, there's, it's impossible. Right. But that's that, that to us, like, and Lee does this too, with, with the, the businesses he's involved in, you know, hockey is hockey and any way you can get the kids into a stick and a ball and playing that sport, the next, uh, honestly, the next, you know, jump is, you know, now you stick on the inlines. Oh, and now you get to put on ice skates and now you get to, you know, now you're playing in a league and now you're playing in structure. So I think that's how it all, it all begins. But I think, you know, you guys have that, I, I mean, honestly, just knowing, you know, what you've done in this very short period of time um, and having, you know, 200 members within this organization already that, and, and to, to, to your point, I think is you think that's just the tip of the iceberg, you, you know, that that's only the people actually oh, yeah. know what you're doing. You know what I mean? I think it's just getting it out there and say, no, 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 we're, we're here and we're ready to go. And I think men's and women side, it's, it's great that there's a, there's an opportunity for, for players with Puerto Rican descent to, to, to strive to get to a, a, a metal international level play. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I think it's, it's within reach again. I mean, there's, there's some, you know, pretty detailed uh, key steps to achieve that goal. Um, you know, I mean, we, we don't, feel the need to jump the gun. So, I mean, we haven't even necessarily communicated with IHF yet because we want to set the foundation first. Um, but we, we, we understand the, the path there uh, quite well. Um, you know, and a part of that is, I mean, they, they want you to prove that you have invested in the growth of the game long-term, right? So we want to do that in a way that maybe, you know, some other nations that have, have been accepted in the past, like, didn't have right so we want to kind of take it where we put that application it's like hey this group is serious right this is this is no joke and and they've invested already resources into growth of the game in their community and you know that that that's our our goal so i mean exactly like you said i mean it's um you know and and i mean the fact that you went down there i mean you could see there i mean it's possible it's just like how do you create consistency um and and how do you build programming where you can keep those players, those athletes, like you said, in that loop where they not only know what's going on with the Puerto Rico Ice Hockey Association, but they have opportunities to uh, compete in the sport. And again, if that starts out, it's just ball hockey, uh, floor hockey, fair enough, right? Uh, it, it's still a step in the right direction, um, in our perspective, at least. Hey, listen, anytime you can get off the ice and get in sandals and go to the beach, <laughs> I'm for that. I'm, I'm 100% on board. Five I'm 100% out. on board. He, he's not <laughs> kidding. He's not kidding, Scott. Mike's done episodes of this show by the water. We've, we've had, we've had <laughs> right. him pop up with an ocean behind him. So, uh, Scott, I want to take a little bit more of a serious turn here with this question. But we hear a lot about how you know hockey is for everyone, and uh, you know I think some strides have been taken, but in reality, we we have a long way to go with that. And I think uh, something that um, maybe our target audience doesn't see is how important it is for younger kids to see broad representation on the ice now. We've had uh, multiple guests on to talk about this. Bryce Salvador, former captain of the Devils, who's an African-Canadian, American. Um, we've had uh, uh, Hockey in Harlem on here. Um, and it, it seems to be a kind of a common theme that, you know, while it seems most people are open to the to the thought of this, right? And, and, and in, my, in my experience, that's true, right? Most people are all about expanding the game. There seems to be a lack of understanding of when a BIPOC kid walks into the locker room, maybe nobody in the room looks like them. That can be a very intimidating moment. Um, I've, ha- I've, I've interviewed players that have said, I don't feel like, you know, I could you know, proverbially let my hair down. I have to be careful. Um, so representation really does matter in this sport. And, and like I said, it's important for young uh, Latinx kids to see you, to see the captain of the women's team, Jasmine, to, to see people that look different. That's how we make hockey for everyone. But that's my thoughts. I think it's more important that we hear your thoughts. You know, what do we need to progress hockey to truly be for everyone? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it's something that's a, a, a constant topic now, right? And it's something where, um, it, you know, there's always room for improvement. So I don't think that that 
conversation ever really ends yeah. right and, and you're constantly learning from that um for me personally in my experience growing up i think like now i mean i'm you know i'm at 30 years old i look back and you know i, I can understand you know different perspectives for me i, I was never really shook by anything it didn't matter it, i probably didn't even notice like anything right i mean I, i've got vargas on the back of my jersey i'm sure at some point there's something there's this there's that i mean i certainly heard like other things around the rink um you know at, at the end of the day i think the what we can do first and foremost is like i said if there's representation in a latin american community um especially through nations right and that's why i, I do believe like something like the latam cup where you get all of these nations uh playing ice hockey in the same place it brings awareness to those communities and then there is some sort of um you know subconscious support there right uh, if i'm you know uh you know puerto rican or colombian or um you know brazilian player before and there is the, oh well there's no hockey in your nation you don't have a national team you don't have this representation on an international stage at all there is you know I mean, at a subconscious level at the very least i mean there is kind of less support there right so for me, I thought, you know, that that tournament, getting everyone in the same place and allowing, um, you know, hopefully more and more so as the years go on, um, you know, kids across uh, the U.S. and across the world, uh, hopefully eventually um, to see, hey, like that's my nation, that's my heritage, what, whatever it might be to them. And now, like I have kind of a spot in, in the hockey world at a, at a deeper level. Right. Um, and I think that's what we can control um we can also control by you know leading by example which is always I mean, it's always tough and it's a it's a you know intense game so certainly you know things get out of line and i think the only way to do that is to continue to um work within like our association right and i think we've got some ideas of of how we can maybe um bring some of those messages back uh to our group right i mean even uh, as Puerto Ricans, I mean, there's still, I mean, things can still go in the reverse, right? I mean, it's like you, you can act without integrity, um, you know, in our situation. I mean, there's certainly times in the tournament things got a little bit heated. So I, I, I'm sure there's, you know, some things that were, you know, done, like, you know, penalties, et cetera, that like, you know, you don't want to do. And I think the only way for us to do that is to kind of continue to learn through the process. Now, um, I mean, the way that we're doing it, like one easy way is, I mean, we're just setting up kind of an internal like webinar series. It's not necessarily directly with that topic, but I think the people that are coming on and the stories that they'll share, um, not only do they resonate with the players, because, you know, we're going to start with Puerto Ricans, they're going to bring some other Caribbean athletes in, um, you know, but you, you get to hear those different perspectives. And I think different perspectives is always what's important. Um, and again, like I said, we'll start by making it about kind of Puerto Rico and that pride, and then we'll expand it from there. Um, and I mean, by hearing different people uh, and their journeys, I think that's how you learn, right? Um, so, I mean, things like this, I mean, like you said, I mean, that this, like, people hear about the Puerto Rico Ice Hockey Association that maybe wouldn't have heard about it before. Um, and I think that's good. So, and also the Latam Cup, I'm sure some of your viewers don't know that that exists and maybe they'll tune in next year. So, right. um, I mean, super, super, again, I mean, you'll see too, like, I don't know if you saw any of the videos that NHL posted, but I mean, there is that like cultural aspect there. You're like, wow. Okay. Um, like clearly there's people that are prideful there. And I think that changes perspective. Like when you realize that, um, there is that community, right. Is, I mean, there's people right. that haven't been exposed to that. Right. So. And, and Scott, you, you know, you, you just said, and this is so true, that we can learn from journeys. And I would love to hear a little bit more about yours. You're giving back to the game of hockey. You're helping to grow the game. What attracted you to the sport? And what did the, the game give to you? And um, what attracted you to hockey? Yeah, uh, I would love to share that. So um, I was born and raised in Tampa, Florida. Uh, my dad uh, came over from Puerto Rico. Um, he was born in San Juan and uh, grew up in, in Levittown. Um, it's, uh, wet west, like kind of Southwest of, of the San Juan area. Um, and you know, he, he came over at the age of 13. I mean, he, he went to high school in Tampa. Um, you know, certainly when he gets angry, he has the accent. I don't have the accent. <laughs> I was born in Tampa. Um, but 
you know, he, he had no clue what ice hockey was. I mean, it certainly wasn't a passion of his. I mean, he was baseball, baseball, baseball. Um, I don't think I've ever seen him actually watch a baseball game, to be honest, um, unless we're actually in the, in the seats in, in, a, in a stadium. But um, so my mom is the one that introduced it to the family. I mean, she's from Pennsylvania. Um, growing up, they had season tickets to the Flyers, um, Broad, Street, Broad Street Bullies. Uh, her, her dad, my, my grandfather on, on that side, um, I mean, he, he had played hockey growing up. Uh, no helmet, obviously back in the day, the, the golden, golden days. Um, and the that, that's days. how we were introduced. Yeah. Now the lightning <laughs> came in a year after I was born. Um, so that was by, you know, coincidence, I guess you could say. Um, and from the age of three, I, I think is when they got me a stick. And I mean, there's pictures like I'm in the kitchen, our first house, like slapping a puck around and, and I was hooked from there. So I, um, you know, grew up my, my entire youth, and through high school, actually, which is kind of non-traditional for anyone in Florida that's trying to play um, in the Tampa area. I actually only played at one rank. Um, that was also kind of not how we did it. I don't know if you get into those topics on this podcast, but like <laughs> my dad said, you're not going to that team that's better this year. I know that five of your teammates did, but you're staying. And no, you aren't playing double A because there's only a single A team this year. Um so, I mean, at the time, as a kid, um, you know, wanting to compete, wanting to win, I think I, I didn't, you know, appreciate that as much as I do now. Um, I think that's super important. And, and I think that was a huge learning process for me. Um, you know, also played every position. It was another kind of, I think, key thing. Um, it was like every season, forward defense, forward defense. So, and I, I would support that within the game now as well. Um, we try to do a little bit of that with our youth teams at the Latam Cup, especially when we had, you know, the, the capability to. Um, and, you know, past that point, I went to, I ended up actually coming back to play juniors even in Tampa, which is even more non-traditional um, under the, uh, my coach there, Brett Strote, um, who he's actually going to do a, a, a little, you know, kind of victory um, webinar with the women. And a couple of weeks, he was a gold medal winning associate head coach uh, with the, the gold medal winning USA team in the last Olympics. Um, so I was an amazing experience, was able to get into the NCAA, uh, played NCAA division three, Finlandia University, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. You've probably never heard of it. Um, the, the school, at least, maybe you've heard of the UP. Uh, they do this <laughs> and we were all the way at the top. Yep. Um, <laughs> a snow globe place and awesome experience was there three years. And then by no direct relation. I ended up somehow playing in Finland, Finlandia to Finland. Um, <laughs> and, and I played there for two years. Uh, after my second year, I had uh, kind of a, a two-year contract that, that I was actually signed on for to continue playing in those. Um, you know, I had tried to do an internship after school and I was like, I can't just give up. So I, I got to kind of live out the dream. It's not what you think of when you're a kid, but, you know, for a while I kind of said, oh, it was kind of like pro, not really. But and now I say, I mean, I play, I got paid to play hockey. So pro. how you many people pro. can say that, right? Right, um, right, exactly. You, you know, and it was just an amazing experience because I'm in Europe and getting exposed to that, that culture. I met a ton of lifelong friends in Finland. Um, you know, and the only reason I didn't continue play that, that in that two-year contract after that second season is because I ran into a startup company. It was a hockey analytics platform. I'm, you know, super interested in more things than just hockey. I love business as well. Um, it was a startup. I thought it was my opportunity to say, hey, like, I'm going to take a stab at this um, and, you know, get some equity and, and ha maybe that's a route and it's kind of like the best of both worlds. So I got to do that for three years. I traveled the world in 23 different countries. Um, so amazing experience. It kind of left my competitive years there. Um, you know, but it was, it was unbelievable. And then that's what you know, I kind of was on a hiatus from, from playing, coaching, et cetera. Um, I just did that, that startup company. And then I've, I've been at ability for, um, a year and like eight months now. And, and I, I got during that time back into it through the Puerto Rico ice hockey association. 
that was a long-winded like uh, answer. <laughs> well, everyone answer. Of it. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. It was so, a great journey. No, yeah, it's just, it, very inspirational. For, yeah, definitely know, not normal, thing. but uh, <laughs> yeah. hey, Scott, to make you feel, I, I have a very non-traditional hockey journey as well. And, and, and look, here's the truth: all all roads lead to adult league. That's a famous quote, but that is <laughs> a, yeah, that's a very true quote. <laughs> <laughs> the, the truth is, it, it doesn't really matter how you get there as long as you get there, right? And you enjoy the journey. And and first off, I love that you went from from Tampa to the exact opposite up in Finlandia. It's just the opposite weather up there completely. And then over to Europe. But yeah. I think, I think for our, our listeners, our parents and coaches, you know, look, there is no direct journey to succeeding in this game. We, we, we do talk a lot about that, Scott, and this has nothing to do with where you're from or, or what you represent. The, the truth is this is the journey is what's important. And uh, I think we get lost a lot to be fair on this. Okay. B A triple A quadruple A 15 A's. And now you're on a select team. They're going pro. I, I can't tell you how many kids do that and don't, don't get to do anything. And they end up hating the game because they've been forced down this path. So uh, I saw Mike clapping a little bit when you were talking about, you know, you didn't change ranks. You stayed where you were and you learned, um, you know, how you utilize your journey, both as a parent player and a coach, to be fair. Um, that's really the key, right? Uh, the truth is this, if you're driven enough, if you're athletic enough, and you have a faith belief system, you can accomplish wonders. And, and I, I bet you'd even say, and again, I want to tap into this. You did that startup. Like I said, your journey is very similar to mine, which is a little weird, but you know, hockey probably prepared, prepared you for the rigors of a startup company, right? In business. Cause starting a business up is very, very, very hard. And then that probably led you to Puerto Rico hockey. Correct. Like these all, these all intertwine. They, they definitely do all intertwine. Um, and again I, I think like there's definitely a lot of learning lessons there through my youth I mean like through kind of that I mean uh, to bring it full circle that um, <laughs> that Puerto Rican culture that my my dad you know drove into me at a young age but um, and the, the persistence the resilience et cetera et cetera but um, yeah it, it I mean the the parallels are certainly there uh, and I think you know now with the I definitely went through some of those patches where it's like, you know, you get with the wrong, in the wrong environment, um, under the wrong leadership and you can easily kind of, um, feel like the game like turned its back against you. Right. Especially when you, you give so much to it or, or it's your passion, it's your, 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 your number one passion. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people share that experience. To, to be fair and not just hockey to be fair either right, it's, I mean right. it's many sports right um but luckily I was able to each time kind of come out of that um and, and find that that passion again and um I mean like you said all, all roads lead to beer league and I tell you what like <laughs> after getting that that first tournament we played in the last time cup 2019 I played division two with I, I I thought we had 11 players I think we actually had only 10 wow um now that I looked back, I looked back at some of the film this week. It, we had 10 players. Four of them were Vargas's. One of them is my dad who started playing hockey. He's 33 years old, right? I tell you what, I, I, yeah, I did that whole journey that I just explained. The most fun I ever had playing hockey at that time was that tournament, That's awesome. right? Yeah. And now the most fun I ever had playing hockey was this last tournament that we did at the 2021 Latem Cup. So for, for that to happen, you know, and especially the Division Two level to be – to be clear, it's not, I mean, that, that's not, I mean, it's not the beer league that I'd be playing, right? Like it's, my dad is playing, he plays C league and Brandon, Florida. Um, would, could, I mean, he loves the game, but I got to play with them and the, the kind of culture atmosphere there and, and just to kind of play to, to just play. Right. Um, and play with pride and, you know, we didn't win. We, we got silver medal that year. Um, but still I mean, most fun I ever had. Um, and now I'm hoping to kind of capture that and, and continue it with the association through the next several years. It's exciting all around. I also love that your dad plays and now you're influencing generations above and behind you, which is amazing. You know, one, one thing I wanted to tap back on, uh, and I think it's another important question is I'm a big Ted Lasso fan. I really liked that show. And, and one of my favorite quotes from that show was a Walt Whitman quote, which was, you know, be curious, not judgmental. And I think we're living, uh, and this is broad, just a very judgmental society right now. People are tired. Uh, you know, the pandemic hasn't helped. <laughs> we're all kind of at the end of our roads here, right? But one of the things that I, I've tried to apply with, with conversations with people is to have conversations with other people about the game, maybe people who don't look like them. And what I find 
Scott, is that a lot of times people are at first judgmental, which I try and, you know, move on from there, but then they're curious and then they're afraid to ask questions, right? Or, or they're nervous about asking questions because they don't want to come across the wrong way. You know, maybe they don't want to insult someone, but I think that to move forward, you have to be curious. So my question to you is how can hockey culture be more curious? What are the conversations that aren't taking place that should be taking place? You know, how, how could someone approach you? Let's say someone's nervous to ask you about hockey Puerto Rico, right? Like what, you know, and again, we've seen this across the board. This isn't just about obviously race. I've seen this with gender, right? I've seen this with, with lots of different sectors within the game. You know, if we're all building towards hockey as hockey, right? The, the goal is that they look at you, they look at me, they, they look at Christy's daughter and they go, oh, that's a hockey player. That's it. That's how the conversation kind of starts then. But what are those conversations that we need to take place? How can someone approach you and ask a question, you know, you know, to, to really be conducive towards growing the game overall? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I can share a couple things. So first I'm innately curious. So I constantly have to kind of, um, you know, gauge that it's, it's one thing to have it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a, a why guy. Like I always ask questions. It drives my girlfriend crazy. Um, she's like, well, why, why do you need to know that answer? It's like, who cares? Like, I don't know. I want to know, like, tell me like, well, why is that? Um, so, so that's one thing. So I have to kind of say, okay, not everybody's like that. Right. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, um, it, it's one of those things like, if you want to learn, right. If, if you're a lifelong learner, again, not everyone has that innately. Um, the, the best way to learn is by hearing those different, uh, opinions, those different experiences, and then kind of, you, you still can create your own truth from that. Right. I mean, you, you, what, what you believe in, but by being armed with all of these different opinions, these different experiences, these different perspectives, you're able to kind of shape a, a bit of a different path. And I mean, I can share with you how, how I kind of came to be, I guess, like how I am is a very like personal story. I don't know that I've actually ever said it like publicly, but um, when I was, uh, I, I think I was maybe 13, um, I was in kind of a, a like a Catholic, um, like it was a, um, is not a Sunday school, but I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it was um, uh, kind of a class like this. It was a like eight week period. We went every week and there was a moment where I, I said something, um, you know, and then you do confession and it, it was nothing like very crazy that I, that I confessed, but the priest said, it, we were talking about hypocrisy, right? It was like one of the teachings. And the priest said to me directly, he's like, Oh, it sounds like a hypocrite. And I was shook to my core. I was like, did the, this priest just call me a, a hypocrite? I was like, ah, is, are you like, is this actually happening? I was like, how, how could I be a hypocrite? I'm, I'm 13. It was like really like actually kind of, um, you know, drove inside. And like, of course the, the effects don't happen immediately. But for me, I think what I became to learn is you have to constantly be thinking like, am I being hypocritical? So I'm constantly in my brain and I'm not perfect by any means. I don't think anyone is, but I'm constantly thinking like, okay, you know, I've expressed my views or I've been very hard on someone for this. You know, am I potentially like, am I changing my opinion? Should I, should I actually have been so hard on that person? Maybe they have a different perspective. Right. And I think if, if each person can come to that realization and through their own journey, right. Then I think that's key. Um, because then you, you're checking yourself. You're like, wait a second. I, and again, like not perfect by any means. I make those mistakes on a daily basis, but then at least I catch myself retroactively and I'm thinking, it could probably have been a little bit better there. Like that was a bad choice to, to, to phrase something in a certain way or do something in a certain way. Um, because I've now changed my opinion and now clearly I, I don't agree with that. So why was I so steadfast to that, you know, belief or that, you know, fact, uh, at the time. Right. And I say fact, yeah. because of course, you know, that's kind of the, the day and age that we're living in. It's like, what is truly fact? And people are trying to kind of use opinions as facts. And I think that's um, difficult, right? Because, right. uh, you know, a fact is a fact and an opinion is opinion. And everyone can have opinions. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, I mean, for me, I also grew up in, 
you know, a family where, I mean, everyone was allowed to kind of have a difference of opinion and have conversation and then not, not get kind of like, um, you know, carried away with it. Right. Like you can disagree. It's okay. It's healthy. Um, and I, it, how do you promote that? I mean, that's, again, I mean, that's, that's a challenge. It's very difficult to do. Um, you know, I, I try to do my best. I don't think anyone has that answer though. Oh, you're, you're doing your best. Trust me. The things that you're creating, create conversations. And look, Scott, that's a great answer. And I'll tell you why, in my opinion, is that I think we're often as a society, especially in America, preoccupied with being right over thinking, right? And the fear of being wrong will keep someone from doing what you just said of just questioning yourself. Am I being hypocritical? Like that fear of being wrong in that question keeps people from even asking the question. Um, and I think that, it, you know, like you said, you had that at a young age, you said 13 years old, right? Um, 12 or 13 years old, I forget, but like, yeah, yeah, it smacked you across the face at that age and it forced you to think a different way. And I, I think that a, a lot of us need the proverbial smack across the face just to think a different way. And, and I'll say it again, be curious, not judgmental. And my version of this, I'm actually very conscious now of when I'm judging people and I, and I try not to do it, but like you said, I'm not perfect either. It does happen. So if I have a judgmental thought, I try and go, what, what is, why am I being judgmental and not curious here? I, I just think we could all use a little bit of that right now. And this is not limited to obviously hockey in Puerto Rico. This is a very broad topic right now amongst several different assets. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, no, but I think it does. I think it does tie into a lot of the stuff that we do, Scott, here on, on these episodes is talking about like, what are we doing as leaders? So, Cause right now, whether, you know, whether you plan to or not, you're, you're a leader in this community, right? right. And you're a, you're a person that can go in an ethical way or an unethical way. You could put players in jerseys that aren't Puerto Rican. You could sneak players into, you know, finding ways to compete. You can, you know, go after kids that maybe you shouldn't go after and know that they can't afford to continue to play hockey and have no other path for them. Or there's all kinds of things that come into play when we're, you know, we had this experience just this weekend, um, you know, with me, I have a, a coach that was in the building on uh, playing in a different rink. And I don't know, there was some mix up in the schedule and the guy's like, this is ridiculous. He's F bombing this. He's like, oh, this is, I mean, I ain't staying here. We're getting out of here. We were just in traffic and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, well, it's, is that, is that big a deal? You know, the game's in, you know, 10 minutes, it's a different rink. Just go to the rink. And then in, like five minutes later, not even three minutes later, the, their, his little goalie, his little 12 year old goalie comes out and the goalie's like, F this. I, you know, we shouldn't be going to this. This is ridiculous. And the coach goes, Hey, Hey, you got to calm down. You know, this is not you, you got. And, and I'm like, well, what? That's hypocrisy. I said, you were just here, had all these parents and all these kids worked up. And I do the same thing. Like I yell at my, you know, I, if I'm going to demand something from my kids uh, as a coach or as an organizer or as an administrator or as somebody that's leading an organization, then I need to, at my best, try to lead in that way too. And, 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 and we are going to make mistakes. I, I mean, I find myself catching it all the time that, Oh, geez, maybe, you know, if I'm talking, if this is really where my core value is for this, you know, why am I, and why am I going this way? And it is hard. I mean, you're, you know, you talked about, you know, what I, I was, I, I actually enjoyed your story about your dad saying, we don't need to go to that other organization. We don't need to go chase something else. You're, you're, you, I'm happy here. You're happy here. You're performing great. You're being a good teammate. You're trying different positions. I'm sure you got a lot of leadership in there because, you were like the veteran all the time, right? You're, you know, it wasn't new kids coming in. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of kids that looked up to you and your family that's saying, well, this, this guy could leave or he should leave or why isn't he leaving? And he's there and he's, and he's committed to the program. And I think that's, we all need that. We need to have parents that are saying, we just talked about this in the last episode, have perspective right. and have the ability to sit back and say at nine and 10 and 11, do I need to go in this path that yeah. may or may not help me. And all I know is this path is actually helping me. And I think, and, I, and I'm healthy and mentally and physically. And there's, a, there's plenty of time for the stress. You know, there's plenty of time to go crazy. And I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's a 10. No, that's great. So I, cheers I, to your I dad. Think, yeah. Look, I mean, there, there are plenty of opportunities to do so. I mean, I, I got to play on some tournament teams, so that definitely helped, right? It, it still stuck to our, our guns, but was able – I mean, there was a year – my 16 – my last 16-year year, I was uh, single A and triple A. Sin single A Central Florida Hockey League, so it wasn't even statewide at the time. It was only in Tampa. 
And I went and played, you know, the top 10 teams ranked nationally, like the next weekend. So, I mean, if you're going to, right. And then it's like high school's in the middle there. So it, I mean, it wasn't easy uh, for sure. Like, especially when you've got to kind of bring people up and I don't think I did the best job either. Like with, especially that, that single light team that year, um, I certainly could have done better, but I think like, again, having the experience and then, you know, retroactively even looking at that and saying like, Oh, okay. I get it. I get that. Like, that makes sense. Like, okay. Um, and then you can kind of use it, right. Like even today, um, you know, I mean, sometimes you're on the ice with guys that aren't as experienced and yeah, I'm not, again, not perfect. So sometimes you're kind of like on the bench, you want to be like, you know, F in this and like, give me the puck or whatever. And sometimes I even do, but, um, m- most of the time I just think, Hey, like, you know, it could probably have, done better on my side right and I, I mean most of the time I'm looking at myself so I think again not everyone's built that way but I, I mean I try to kind of do that myself and then if you lead by example hopefully there's people that that you know replicate that um and then I guess to your point like about just you know kind of doing the right thing I mean for me there's kind of a, a, a few aspects there that I think are just in hockey in general like usually the look past you know, number one, I mean, we're in a nonprofit, right? So, um, and, and we're also using and this, this phrase, grow the game. I mean, so the, the two things we're doing is nonprofit. So, I mean, this is not for profit, right? There's certainly some teams there. They pay the coaches, blah, blah, blah. Look, I thought I was going to do three teams. I ended up with five teams. I did it myself. You know, I, I thought the first year it was important for me to like learn every single aspect of it so that the next year can bring in help and really understand the intricacies of that entire process was not easy. I mean, could have been high stress. I don't think I really let that get to me. Um, but you know, again, no, no profits being taken. I mean, no money's being taken out. And I think that's something that gets way carried away in hockey. Um, you know, second thing on grow the game and we're not just doing Puerto Rico and even the association, the, the corporation of, of our organization, it's to grow the game in the Caribbean as well. Right now, not to say that we won't try to do it outside of the Caribbean, but the Caribbean is our backyard. And we're trying to say, hey, like there are nations, Haiti, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, Cuba. There's a ton of Cuban ice hockey players, really. And they don't have uh, formal or, you know, they have pieces to that puzzle, but they don't have formal like ice hockey um, teams yet. So we're saying we'll do Team Caribbean across the board and bring people in and give them an opportunity and then help them launch their nations. Basically create our competitors, which, again, I, I think that's a positive thing. I mean, we get then more competition locally we don't have to go to, to europe we don't have to go to asia etc um you know so that's that and then i mean the other piece to it is i see a ton of times still today it's like everyone in hockey maybe sports in general it's like i could do that better and instead of it, it just kind of collaboration occurring it's like i could do that better so i'm just gonna do my own thing i'm gonna create my own organization i'm gonna create my own um you know uh, tournament team. I'm going to create my own camp. I'm going to do this, that, the other. I'm going to do my own clinic. And it's just all this competition. But what is the point? I mean, if it's for profit, fair enough. I mean, you got to run your business. But like, if it's for the reasons that you generally cite, it's like, oh, we're going to do things better. Our association is going to be this, that, and the other. Well, you're competing with the players, basically. I mean, if it's for the players, I mean, generally speaking, you should find a way to have that collaboration and sure influence the heck out of that organization to be better, but does it really help the players? If you're just bringing up another, you know, group and just they're tugging pull like uh, across the board. Right. And again, I could have easily gotten trapped in that, you know, to bring this back to the, the point about my father making me play at the same rank, but you know, I didn't because I, I didn't have a choice. So, um, I mean, I think that's another thing where like, you know, for example, I mean, we could, we could go and, and within the association, we could like create an event, for example, but like, what's the point? I mean, there's events that are created, like let's work with those events. Right. Um, maybe we create another opportunity at a different time, like six months out from that period. So there's two opportunities, right? Um, you know, I mean, that, that's what I believe in, at least. I think it's it's something you can do to, to help, help the game, like you know, persevere past those um, you know, differences of opinion, right? So, so Scott, you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're in the path. If you look at like team USA women's right. 
what good would it be for Team USA women to just continue to not help grow nations, nation building of hockey, if all at the end of the day they're playing Canada? Right. And what happens is if it's two two countries playing against each other, the the the, the sport can't grow. So there would be no if all the money in the world could go into Puerto Rico hockey, but if you have no competition, then you can't grow the sport because nobody wants to watch Puerto Rico play the same team every weekend, right? So I think that the ability to have the, you know, to, to have the self-awareness that you have to have nation building of hockey in the locations you're in and like nations that can support you and vote the way you want them to do for the IIA, Jeff, and be international and, and say, listen, we all, us little countries are just as big as the big country. You know, we get the same vote. One vote is one vote is one vote is one vote. So how do we get Malaysia and Cuba and whoever, you know, whoever, I don't know, whoever it is, you know, uh, getting more teams only helps all those small developing countries. And I, and that's why I, I mean, me, that's my personal opinion, why, you know, USA hockey women's can't grow and women's hockey can't grow as much because they only compete against Canada. There is no other competition, you know, in the finals, it's, Oh, us playing Canada again. And people, there's no, there's nothing, there's no flavor to that. There's no excitement to that. Maybe for this, the small little world that's watching it, but for the big world, all of a sudden somebody wants to say, what? Puerto Rico's playing who like they're, you know, how is that possible? Like, how do you know? And then that's how you get the conversation started. And I think that's where, you know, now the nation's working together, help grow their own niche and where they want to be. Is Puerto Rico going to be USA women's hockey? It, 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 it's a really high mountain, but could they be this whole other subset of hockey that gets to compete and in, into what you just did having a tournament where, how many teams are in the tournament? Women's teams or men's? Uh, women's was um, uh, there, we had some that could have come for COVID. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, uh, six. Yeah. So, so think about that. I mean, oh, 19, five, in 2019, five. it went, it went yeah. two, right? And now it's six, and maybe it's twelve, and then it's now you have, and then if you're collaborating and working together, it's bigger. And having you know support in South, South Florida where you're getting the rink to support it. You're getting that community to say, well, we have to support this because this is, these are hockey fans. Like these are people that are going to buy hockey jerseys. Well, these are people yeah. going to be watching NHL network. These are people going to be, they're just exposed to the sport. But at the same time, we could all give this whole nother community to hockey uh, that wouldn't normally get it. So I think it's just, a, it, I, I personally think that's, you know, the way you're going about it and the way you're growing it is, is, it almost becomes a blueprint for how can we have successful programming? Well, we build all of us and we're going to maybe, you know, we're going to revel in the fact that maybe Puerto Rico doesn't win next year. If another team wins for the good of the sport and the good of our community, it's maybe better. And, and it, and it just grows and, and gets bigger. So I, you know, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a really unique way of looking at it. And I think it's uh you know, it's great that you're you know leading that charge. I think that's, I think that's, and you know, anybody else that's in your committee and, and with you in your group. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the <laughs> I mean, we're we're trying to do an event um, here in the spring. We haven't like formally launched it yet, but uh, probably looking at Chicago. Um, and you know, again, I mean, it would be awesome if we can do uh, you know Puerto Rico versus Team Caribbean. There, be you know, we we would kind of really field both teams, right? But then again, we're giving not just opportunities to the two Team Caribbeans we had um, at the Latam Cup because we had a U16 and a U12 we'd be, you know, growing that to match the number of teams that we play. So if we've got seven teams, they've got seven teams. And all of a sudden you've got a, a pool of, you know, twice as many players that are there for the same, you know, reason. I mean, they're representing, you know, and the, the team Caribbean case, certainly they're representing multiple nations, which is kind of even more powerful, right? Like you said. Um, so, yeah, I, I see no, no, and we want to win still clearly. Right. But like, you know, if, if you don't, you can't, you can't say like, oh, like we want to win. And then it's like, oh, but we're not going to like make sure we have the best right. competition. So like you want to beat the well, best it's just It's just like the teams. I walk into the rink and we find out, oh, they're missing their best player and their goalie's not even a goalie. We can win this game. Right. I'm like, you really I, want to I, play this game? I just you know, I, I, you know, I, I remember being in a men's league game and the goalie wouldn't show up. Like, hey, we get we get the forfeit. We get the win. I go, what the hell is that? Like, we, yeah. we want to play. We want to, I want to play against competition. Like, I want to build a competition right. strong enough right. so I can play them. And, and then, then it's worth winning. Right. So I think that's, that's, uh, it's funny that, you know, it's just, oh, well, if we could just be the best team all the time. Well, and that's Mike, great. Mike, I just had a great conversation with my Mike team this week and we were in a close game 
And I could see they were flustered. And I said, you know, team, this is how it's supposed to be. You're not supposed right. to win by 10 goals every game. They're a good team. But I said, these are the games you want to be in. It's competition. And, and I think, uh, you know, Scott, look, look, I love that you want to win, right? I, I'm just like that. I, I hate to lose. But, yeah, you want the, you want to compete. The com- competition's the gift. And, uh, Scott, I'll tell you, you know, we've had a few episodes in a row here on Perspective, and you've certainly provided us with some perspective today, uh, not just on hockey in Puerto Rico, but hockey in emerging nations and what it takes to grow the game, uh, really, really in, in maybe non-traditional hockey markets. But before we let you go, because it was a fun hour, it kind of flew by, um, for the people listening, right, uh, where can they get more information? If, if there's families out there listening that, that have the background that's correct, uh, or people that even just want to volunteer to help, where, where do they find more information about, about you and what you're doing? Uh, yeah, so right now we've got um, kind of active channels on both Instagram and Facebook. Um, Instagram is at uh, Puerto Rico Ice Hockey. Um, and then uh, Facebook, I believe, is slash uh, Puerto Rico Ice Hockey. I'll have to check that one to be sure. But I, I can send it to you if you want to link it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. that, that's where they can find all the information now. Um, I mean, past that, I mean, we field emails quite a bit. Um, right now, we're just using a Gmail account. Uh, we're going to launch our website here, um, you know, hopefully before Thanksgiving. Um, and again, that's going to become like that, that source of truth for everything happening within the association moving forward. Um, and again, like as we continue to build that Team Caribbean, um, you know, program as well, I mean, that, that will be the location as well. We'll probably launch like a separate side site for that too. Um, you know, but that, that's, that's where everything is as far as like uh, registration for volunteering. We do have a, a form that we have not formally launched, but there is going to be a registration form for like non-player members. Um, and right now actively on that Instagram account, there is a link um, to a registration form. So if there's any, um, you know, players of Puerto Rican heritage listening that want to um, jump in and, and register or any players that would represent Team Caribbean, the option for both of those is there. Um, and, and we, you know, we'd love to, to hear from you. So hopefully we can get, uh, some, some support there. And, um, I mean, past that, uh, you know, again, as we launch the website, we'll be kind of letting people know like what they can do to help. I know the biggest inquiry we get is about jerseys. Um, we're in the midst of kind of getting a new vendor for, for jerseys now. Um, as soon as we have that, we will launch that and, and we'll, we'll have a, a team store where they can buy uh, direct to consumer uh, jerseys. Right. Uh, we don't want to necessarily handle inventory. It's not our, <laughs> not our business. I understand. But, I understand. Yeah. Christy, Mike, any final words before I close this up? Thank you for sharing this time with us. Um, I can't wait to see where you and your team go. Um, just it's so exciting. And I hope people listening, we get a worldwide audience now that you're going to get a lot of support for your many goals for um, what you're doing. So thank you for letting us be a part. Thank you. Yeah, I love it. And I think it's going to enjoy watching you guys grow and, and uh, add more hockey down there to uh, all these developing hockey nations. And uh, I think it's a, it's a really noble cause and hey, listen, more hockey is better for all of us. Though. So I yeah. think it's uh, I think it's great that you're reaching out to a whole nother, another uh, group. And let's see some more. Uh, let's see that. Let's see a new rink down in Puerto Rico. That'd be nice. I agree with that. Yeah, it would be. It would be. Destination <laughs> capital of the world. My God. Uh, let's go. Yeah, I would love for that. And, and Scott, look, I, I started the episode by calling you a trailblazer and icon. And I'll tell you what, the trailblazers and icons never think they are, but you are. All right. The stuff that you're building, the teams are building, and everybody involved with the program down there, you're setting the foundation for, you know, generations to come of of you know puerto rican and, and latin american descent and in the caribbean so i want to congratulate you i want to thank you for all the work that you've done and continue to do and uh, everyone involved with that program and thanks for joining us today yeah appreciate it thank you okay that's going to do it for this edition of our kids play hockey with scott vargas for christy casciano burns and mike benelli i'm lee elias you can check out this episode and every episode we've ever done at ourkidsplayhockey.com or just look wherever you listen to podcasts. We're there. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you next time on Our Kids Play Hockey.